Good morning, friends and saunterers. We're live. We're in the kitchen today because my dear friend Dottie is out the front making the dickens of a racket, bashing and crashing. And so <laughs> here we are. So, um, and the Merry Christmas back to front, which just goes to show I'm using the selfie camera on the phone. All these technical things to think of. Anyway, good to see you. And hi, Pete and Kathy. Great to see you guys. Um, let's pray and we'll get going. We'll get sauntering. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for the exciting season that we're in leading up to Christmas where we get excited about your arrival on this earth as a tiny baby. And Lord, as we open your word today, we ask you to speak to us and open our hearts and open our minds and our imaginations to see what you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Sarah and Fliss and Pete and Sally and Fran. Everybody, now we are, let me see if I can gather my wits. So today, we, uh, yesterday, we looked at the story of um, Abraham's near-miss sacrifice of his son Isaac. Puffing cup. I look like I've got fangs. It's to do with the light. Um, so, and uh, we saw how that was this incredible prophecy about Jesus in, on all kinds of levels. And um, it, it's just really stunning. And so here we go today. We're going to sort of follow on with that train of thought. But we are looking at Abraham still. And just in that, in that chapter we looked at um, yesterday, chapter 22 of Genesis... I'm just going to read a little bit and then we're going to trampoline off of that one into some more scriptures. Good morning, Sky, and good morning, Rachel. Nice to have you back, Rachel. Um, and um, so chapter 22, just following on from the sacrificial moment, um, verse 15, it says, And the angel, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and, and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So there we go. Now this is just a stunning verse, which is momentous for Abraham. It's momentous for us. It's such a significant word. And here comes my beautiful wife, who's going to pass in front of me like a vision of beauty. <laughs> She's gone. There you, you just saw this flash of red, look like Santa Claus. It's actually Anna. So um, I've turned the washing machine off, darling, just while I'm doing this. Sorry, that is sacrilege in this house yes, to turn the washing is. machine off. Right, focus, Paul. So um, he says, this is God speaking through an angel. It's the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham and he says, by myself I've sworn I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Now we understand in that little context there that offspring means plural. It means children. But offspring and um, the, the context of it here, it can, it's like sheep. We can say his sheep meaning a sheep or his sheep meaning a flock of sheep and offspring is the similar word and it's a similar in Hebrew interestingly if I'm understanding it correctly it reads exactly the same in Hebrew it's the word seed and seed is the same you can say his seed meaning oh he's planted his seed i.e one seed or you could say he's planted his seed or she's planted her seed in the garden and it could mean 2,000 seed and so here, God is saying, I'm going to multiply your offspring. So clearly that's referring to plural. But then it goes on to say, and your offspring shall possess the gates of the gate of his enemies. Now, you remember Jesus. He famously said, I will build my church 
and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. It's not going to win against it. So Jesus said, however many thousand years later, I will build my church and the gates of this kingdom, if you like, of hell and darkness is not going to stand against my kingdom. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Pat. Buenos dias, Flor. Te amo mucho. And uh, so we um, see that here in this story of Abraham making this incredible sacrifice, we have a prophetic statement that is speaking of the coming Messiah, the coming Jesus, the one we know to be Jesus. He's saying, your offspring, that can be plural, it can be singular, remember, shall possess the gate of his enemies. Now, we translate that his, it can also mean their, but even even these words, they are, um, it's not, it doesn't, the, <laughs> I'm getting too technical, right? Okay, let's just say it can be singular or it can be plural. But Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. This to me is a clear messianic prophecy. This is a prophetic breadcrumb that is pointing to Jesus. Whew, there we go. So let's leap on through now to chapter 49 of Genesis. Genesis 49, and tucked away in this almost end of the book of Genesis, we've got another incredible story, incredible moment, if you like, prophetic moment. Good morning, Shelley. Good to see you. I hope you're well. And it says, verse uh, chapter 49, Jacob blesses his sons. And so Jacob called all his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Now, if you've listened to the, or watched the Andrew Lloyd Webber, Joseph and the Technicolored Dreamcoat, you'll know that Jacob had a load of sons. In fact, he had 12 sons, didn't he? And one of them was famously Joseph, the dream boy with the dream coat and the, all the affection of his dad and favourite kind of golden boy. And Jacob now is is um Jacob now has gathered his sons together he's old and he's going to bless them and we know that in the bible blessing counts for a huge deal it's massive and also it's massive now if we only understood the significance of it we can do this same kind of stuff that Jacob's doing so he gathers his sons together and he starts to bless them but these blessings are more than just nice words from an old guy who's about to pop his clogs. These are deeply prophetic. And there's a sense in which when we bless, we actually call something into being that wasn't there before. So it's much different to, oh, bless. Whatever is that? That's a load of nonsense. That means nothing. Oh, bless. It's, that's just, just nonsense when we understand what blessing is. Blessing is releasing power. Blessing is releasing the favour of God into somebody's life. As a parent, we need to bless our kids. As a neighbour, we need to bless our neighbours. We need to, when we say God bless you, we're actually expecting God to intervene in the lives of the person that we bless. And we can say, I bless you in the name of Jesus. Acting on behalf of Jesus I bless you. Right, that's a digression. But here we have a blessing that Jacob's given to his sons. And we would assume from the story, the narrative of Joseph going down into Egypt and all the rest of it being such a champion, we would assume that he's going to get the best blessing. But listen to this in chapter, in verse 8. It said, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. That is really interesting because Joseph saw in a vision his father's sons bowing down to him. And that actually happened when they went down to Egypt. That really happened. But this is something bigger. This is something different. This is another day. We don't know that this ever happened in Judah's lifetime. So this is really significant. Because there's nothing wasted in the Bible. It's not a, there's no puff or spare cloth in the Bible. It's all completely, 
there for a reason. Each word, every jot, every punctuation mark is there for a reason. Every inflection. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares rouse him? He's saying, wow, Judah, you're like a lion. You're fierce, you're powerful, you're, wow, you got teeth. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter, hold on, we'll come to it. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Wow. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's coat to the joy colt. Sorry, that's kind of donkey puppy thing. Baby, baby donkey, not puppy. Um, has his donkey's cult to the vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture, that's his robes, in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Now I've read it all because I think this is a passage which is totally, utterly loaded. I mean this is super loaded. Right, he's saying Judah you are like a lion's cub. Well, when we read the book of Revelation, we're introduced to Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right. The name Judah, Yehuda, means strength or praise. So in his name, the very name is prophetic. And, and what God is saying is, listen, Judah. All of the other stuff that's gone on, because Judah was not a particularly 100% good guy. He did some bad stuff and it's all written down so we can see it. It's a matter of public record, if you like, that Judah messed up big style. But now God is saying to him, Judah, you are a lion and the scepter, the rule, the authority is not going to depart from you until... It says in some translations, until Shiloh comes to him, nobody really knows what Shiloh means, but they think it means tribute or what is deserved. And so there's a sense of, <laughs> he's saying, Judah, you're going to continue to have authority and rulership until this thing happens and, and the tribute comes to you. And the obedience of all the peoples, the obedience of the peoples. Wow. Good morning, Alison. So now Judah died. We don't know that he ever had any particular rule and reign other than being the head of a tribe of Israel, which was significant. And we remember him for that. But these, like a number of other prophecies we're going to look at, are reaching forward into the future. And when God says forever, he means forever. So clearly, for that to be fulfilled by a human being, one person, is not going to happen. So it must mean that it's referring to his descendants having that authority that continues forever and ever and ever. Now, the only way that is fulfilled is through one person, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah. Isn't that amazing? He wasn't born of the tribe of Joseph, which split into two. He wasn't born from either of those tribes. He was, he was born from the tribe of Judah. And so what God is doing here, he's saying, right, Abraham, let's, let's tell the whole story. He's saying, Abraham, you're going to be blessed. You're going to have a son. And through this one son, Isaac, is going to come blessing to the whole world. In fact, there is going to be one particular one of your descendants who's going to possess the gates of his enemies. He's literally going to take over hell, boom, and wreck it and rule it and plunder it, which is awesome. So that's Jesus, right? But then he's now, then it goes to Isaac, the son of, so then Isaac, God makes the same promises to Isaac. He says, Isaac, you're going to be blessed, you're going to be 
fill in the whole earth of your descendants and so on and so on and so on. Promise, the same promise I made to Abraham, I'm making to you. And then it passes to Jacob and Jacob, because Jacob's got a brother who God doesn't choose, but he's called Esau. And God, God's blessing falls onto Jacob. And then Jacob then pours out this blessing. But instead of it following through to the one we would imagine who was Jacob's favourite initially, Joseph, it falls onto Judah. Whew. So now, but listen to this language. He says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And so he's foretelling the day which the Bible talks about where every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So we know that this, this fulfillment of this particular prophecy is 100% in Jesus Christ himself. But listen to this. The, all the other little references in here, if you're a bit of a Bible scholar, you'll have spotted them. So we've got the Lion of Judah, we've got the Scepter. So Jesus is referred to as the Lion of Judah in the book of Revelation. We've got the Scepter, which is all about rule and authority. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. We're going to come to that. Um, and so it's all about authority. It's about every knee bowing. That's three things in this one prophecy until tribute comes in, the, the obedience of the people, they're going to kneel before him. Three, we've got a reference to a foal, and it's the donkey's foal. It's a cult of a donkey. Well, goodness sake, Jesus came into Jerusalem riding the cult of a donkey. It's not even like general, oh, riding a donkey. It's riding the cult of a donkey. And so here we've got this little subtle reference thrown in right there back, tucked in at the end of the book of Genesis. There it is, a reference to the donkey. And then he's going to harness it. To, so he's going to tie it up to the, a choice vine. I don't know why you'd tie a donkey to a vine particularly, but Jesus is the vine. In John 15, it says, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, etc., etc., etc. And he talks about the fruitfulness that comes from him and from hanging around with him. He says, those who remain in me will bear much fruit. And so this is this another picture of Jesus. So that's five, five references. And then it goes on, he's washed his garments in wine. Well, if we look in Isaiah 61, we see... It says, who is this coming up from Edom, coming up from Bosra? And his garments are dipped in blood. And it talks about he's washed, um, he's trodden the vine press alone. And so it's mixing the metaphors of the blood of the vine, the blood of the grape. But he's saying, yeah, this is God in a, a we haven't got time to go into it, but the one in Isaiah 61, uh, 63 rather is all about Jesus bringing redemption, bring, paying the price to make a way for us to be with the Father forever. So then that's six, and his eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. Well, if you did the saunter through the Song of Songs with me earlier this, just a few, uh, few weeks ago, this is the language of the Song of Songs. So we've got seven. <laughs> if anyone is into prophecy, Seven is the number of perfection. We've got seven direct references to Jesus. This is the language that the beautiful woman refers to the bridegroom in. This kind of language is teeth are whiter than milk. Isn't this just incredible? So there we have it. There's our prophetic breadcrumb for today. You've got two for the price of one. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, isn't he awesome? Tucked away there in the last but one chapter of Genesis, we've got this almost three-dimensional representation of Jesus, the Lion of Judah, the ruler who everyone is going to bow before, the scepter, the scepter of righteousness goes out from him. From it, oh, and then the vine and the foal of the donkey and his Garments dipped in blood it's to do with redemption, to do with purchasing men and women by shedding his blood for them. 
Wow. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Chris. Um, so there we have it. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So we know now that we've we've the river, if you like, of God's choice that's leading us to the Messiah has diverted. It's, it could have gone in one of 12 ways and it's gone into the tribe of Judah. So, Lord Jesus, <laughs> we want to thank you for how your word is so full of meaning, is so layered and rich and dense with prophecy and meaning and significance, Lord. And, and thank you that it all speaks of you. It's all pointing to Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that you are the one, you are the true vine, you're the one who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, you're the one whose kingdom is from everlasting to everlasting. Lord, we love you and we surrender our hearts to you again today. We love you. Amen. Have a stunning day, you guys, and we'll see you tomorrow. Who knows where we'll be? Maybe outside with Captain Squawky. Take care.